Okay, welcome to lecture number five, light and color. So what we'll talk about in this lecture is first, light, a little bit about atmospheric perspective, and we learn a nice Italian word, chiaroscuro, hatching and cross-hatching, uh, and we'll look at a work in progress, Mary Cassatt's in the loge, and we'll look at value. After that, when we get to color, we'll talk about basic color vocabulary, color schemes, uh, look at Chuck Close's Stanley and a modern representation of that same technique. And then color and representational art, works in progress. Uh, we're not going to spend any time on electric prism. Uh, symbolic use of color and the critical process, thinking about light and color. Uh, so let's get to it. So if you're colorblind, you're looking at this image right now and you don't see anything at all. Um, if you can see color, you'll see a number 60 uh, in green in the middle. So um, scientists, when they've looked at color, they've kind of uh, made a lot of changes over the years as far as um, how they theorize it. Um, so in the 17th century, uh, Isaac Newton said, we see color because some colors of spectrum are absorbed and some are reflected. And that's pretty close to how we see color uh, when we're looking at surfaces. So light and color create space, um, meaning they create um, when you're most of the time when you're making art with light and color, a lot of times you're using two dimensional works. So light and color can create the illusion of three dimensions. Uh, so colorblind people, as a result, uh, when they look at the real world, they perceive space uh, slightly differently. And that's the same with animals who don't seem the same, same span of colors that we see. So first looking at light, we're looking at Le, Le Cabousier and his um, church called Notre Dame du Haut uh, Ronchamp. And uh, the idea with light as a subject uh, comes from Gothic cathedrals. So starting in the uh, 12th century and Le Cabousier, even though he's a modernist artist, meaning he's an artist that uh, started to make his work in the first half of the 20th century. Um, he also, when he was commissioned to make a church, used light as a subject. So when you're inside of this church, uh, you can see light and it has um, a meaning to it. Uh, it's a spiritual type of light. So atmospheric perspective, you can have a lot of examples, but the textbook I used to use for this class uses a version of the rocks uh, but maybe not the best version of it. So I'm going to show you another version of it that enables you to see atmospheric perspective a little bit better. So atmospheric or aerial perspective, um, a technique often employed in landscape painting designed to suggest three-dimensional space and a two-dimensional space of the picture plane and in which forms and objects distant from the viewer become less distinct, often bluer or cooler in color, and contrast among the various distant elements is greatly reduced. Uh, so we can look at the next slide, which is another version of the same painting. And if you look in the background, uh, the mountains that are in the far background, you can see they're cloudy in the one on the left. And the one on the right, uh, they kind of turn blue. So most of you live in Michigan and might not have ever lived in an area where you have hills and you can see them very far away. But I can confirm <laughs> that you stand on a big hill and you see hills in the background or a mountain uh, that they turn kind of bluish and fade out. So that's atmospheric perspective and it gives you the impression that things are very far away. Um, and part of the reason we see this because we're literally looking through the blue sky. Uh, so everything looks blue when it's very far away. So JMW Turner kind of takes advantage of this sort of technique and does something a little bit more expressive with it. Um, so in the Brunner from the Lake of Lucerne, uh, Sayre says, dominance of light over line. The space is created by light instead of line. Uh, so when you see this at first, you might not be able to figure out what's going on, but when you start to see the details, you can see there's a lake, um, some people on rafts in the lake and some houses here, and then um, a mountain in the background. And by using atmospheric perspective and making everything kind of obscured, almost as if we're seeing it through clouds, it gives you the impression that um, the mountain in the background is very, very far away. 
but it also creates a sense of mystery. Like if you live here, you may see clouds that look like this. So you might think, oh, is that a mountain in the background or is it just cloud forms? Um, so Turner really liked Rembrandt who would create mystery in his paintings by obscuring the details. Like in this example of the mill, there's not a lot you can see. Everything seems like it's kind of cloudy, but it creates this kind of mysterious feel. So Tintoretto is using another light technique in this one. Um, whenever you look at this picture, most people, they're attracted to the light parts of the picture, and especially the brightest light in the picture, which shows Jesus. So light emphasizes Christ rather than perspective. And I'll show you Leonardo's Last Supper in a moment. So light here symbolizes the spiritual world and darkness our earthly home. So Tintoretto has Jesus and the apostles and then some angels around the light. Um, and we see some angels up here as well. And then a table acts as a separation between the light and dark. And we see all of the people who are serving the table and even animals. Unfortunately, people during Tintor Tintoretto's time thought the animals didn't have any souls. So you have little kitties and puppies and such. Um, and you can also see that Judas, the apostle who is going to betray Christ, he's on the dark side. So very cool effect of very light and very dark, but it also um, has an effect as far as the content, the meaning of the work. So if you look at Leonardo, he did it in a different way. He did it using line. So all of the lines of the picture kind of lead towards Christ in the middle. So chiaroscuro is used by artists who draw or paint. Um, and it's a way to what artists call like mold with light. It's a way to take something that is two-dimensional and make it look like it's three-dimensional. So chiaro in Italian means light and oscuro means dark. Uh, so chiaroscuro is a combination of light and dark, a balance of light and shade. So modeling is um, the use of chiaroscuro across a rounded or curved surface. Uh, so we can see the feminine figure here and she looks three-dimensional because we see shading throughout her body um, and that kind of molds her. Um, and one thing that's important to do as artists, if you want it to look like a realistic um, kind of figure, you portray the way a light is coming from a particular direction. So you can see that the light is coming from um, in this particular picture, based on the shadows, it's coming from the top right. So if you, you can tell the light direction if you look at the brightest parts of the picture. So her nose, you can see the top of her breast and her shoulder. Um, that's where the light is hitting first. So those are the brightest parts. Um, the artist in this particular case just leaves the brightest parts empty um, so that you see the background of the paper. Um, and the empty parts are called reserve. So in this case, since the paper is light, the reserve is the light areas. So if you ever take a drawing class, you'll learn how to make shadows, uh, doing something a little bit simpler than a feminine body uh, that Prudhon is doing, um, and usually with a sphere. Um, so shadows have many parts, and artists were actually the ones who did um, the best job in kind of understanding how shadows work uh, because they wanted to portray things as they were. Um, so we have the different parts of the shadow, the highlight, and that's right where the light hit for, hits first. Uh, then some light uh, and kind of a halo of the highlight. Uh, some shadow, the core of the shadow, uh, reflected light, and then a cast shadow. Uh, so one subtle thing the artist recognized is that when you have a shadow, um, but if you have like a light surface, there's also some reflecting, reflective light that's coming off the surface. So if you look at her thigh, you can see how it's lightened a bit at the bottom, and that rep represents the reflected light from the surface, perhaps from her hand or something like that. So people can use light and shadow to create um, a certain mood or to create content. Uh, so in this one, Artemisia's 
uh, Jenna Lesky's uh, Judith and her maidservant with the head of Hol Holofernes, which if you want to see in person, this is the Detroit Institute of Art. Um, so women first became prominent in the broke period as artists. And this is mostly because uh, before this time period, um, most women uh, couldn't get into the arts. And if they did, they were expected to quit as soon as they got married. Um, and Jenna Lesky was actually working in a world where she was expected to quit if she got married, but she didn't. Uh, and she kept working. Uh, so she did that of her own accord. So this is a Bible story. And if you are a Christian, you're from a Protestant background, you won't be familiar with this story uh, because it was taken out of the Bible by Martin Luther. But Catholics uh, and Orthodox Christians will be familiar with this story. So in this story, Judith, who is a heroine, the entire book is about her. Um, she decides that she's going to do something about the Assyrian general Holofernes, who had surrounded uh, the Jews at this time, the ancient Hebrews, um, and uh, would not let the, her people go. Um, so she made, she was supposed to be very, very beautiful. Uh, so she made her way into the camp uh, with her maidservant. And, you know, you can imagine the guards at the camp, the Assyrian guards were like, yeah, come on in. You two are looking fine. Uh, and they had a plan that they would get him drunk um, and all of his people really drunk, you know, with the promise of maybe something they could get from these two women. Um, and they would just like pour all their drinks out and let everybody else get really drunk. And uh, when they passed out, uh, they would take his sword and cut off his head. Uh, they successfully did so. And you can see Judith right here still holding the sword and her maidservant is stuffing the head of Holofernes into a bag so they can take it back to the Hebrews. And the Hebrews know that the Assyrian army is now headless, literally, uh, but there's no general. Uh, so many people wondered why Jenna Lesky would pick this particular story uh, to paint over and over again. One reason is it was a really popular story for painters at this time. Uh, but the other reason is that Jenna Lesky, uh, her first art teacher, which her father um, hooked her up with, uh, raped her. Um, and she actually told her father that this teacher raped her um, and they tried to prosecute him, uh, but he was never convicted. Um, so you might imagine how she would find a story like this where a woman um, takes down a powerful man uh, who has wronged her. So Jenna Lesky uses kind of an extreme form of chiaroscuro called tenebrism. Uh, and it comes from the Italian world word tenebroso, which means murky. And in this way, it can kind of add drama to a scene. Like in the theater, people use a spotlight and darken the rest of the stage for drama. We can see that the candlelight um, acts as a spotlight. Um, it obscures somewhat the head being stuffed into the bag. Uh, but we see the light on both Judith and um, her maidservant. And you can see how they're kind of looking to make sure that nobody's waking up to find them. So light can be a way to make interesting content and moods. So hatching and cross hatching is um, a series of techniques that are used by people who are drawing when you can't change the thickness of your line. Uh, so drawing when you're using pen, especially when you only have one choice of thickness of line, uh, you can create shadows um, by using hatching, which is an area of closely spaced parallel lines to create an effect of shading or modeling. So the shading we had looked at in the previous slides. So you can see some of the hatching going on here in the neck. And then cross hatching is what's going on in a lot of other places here uh, on the cheek uh, to kind of create the, the prominent cheekbones and the kind of way that the um, cheek of this particular figure sinks in a little bit. So cross hatching, two or more sets of roughly parallel and overlapping lines set an angle to one another uh, to create a sense of three dimensionality and modeled space. Um, so you can pick out the various uses of hatching and cross hatching in this drawing. So with this one, the loge, uh, we have a lot of things going on with uh, light and shadow uh, to create 
something that actually exists or seems to exist outside of the frame. So we have a diagonal composition and you can see the original um, kind of planning drawing with this one. And this is Mary Stevenson Cassatt. Uh, so this is our study at the top and then a finished painting right here. Um, and it kind of deals with something that is interesting. Uh, it's the concept of the male gaze. Uh, and the male gaze is usually used to think of um, an art to talk about how um, images of women, uh, feminine images, are usually or almost always, depending on the period, created by men. Um, so this gaze can affect uh, certainly the way that uh, women are portrayed in art, but also how women experience the world, uh, where men believe that they can define women, um, how they should look. Uh, and even in the case of this particular picture, uh, can look at them and almost possess them through this look. Uh, so we see how uh, the feminine figure is looking with her opera glasses towards the stage, uh, but um, this guy that is across the balcony is looking at the feminine figure. Uh, so almost her comment on, she wouldn't have known the phrase male gaze, but she'd understand it because she's a woman in the world. She knows that... Um, that you often have men's eyes laying on you at all times. So when you're talking about value, uh, you're talking about uh, naming the uh, relative lightness or darkness of the picture and the colors and employed in it. So if something has um, a high value, you'll say that it's, it's got lots of light colors. Um, and then if it's a low value, uh, then we'll say that it has uh, lots of dark colors. So you can mix value with color uh, and you can get some pretty interesting effects. So Pat Steer with these pictures, pink chrysanthemum and night chrysanthemum, it's basically taking the same flower, uh, but using various hues, tints, and shades uh, to get different effects. So a hue is a color usually on the six basic colors of the spectrum. Um, so if you use Photoshop, you might be familiar with how hues work, uh, but we'll look at the six basic colors so you get an idea. So this is basically like the most um, standard small crayon box. Those are the hues, uh, you know, when you have six crayons in there, or eight crayons in there. Then tint is a color or hue modified by addition of another color resulting in a hue of hierarchy or value. Um, and then a shade is a color or hue modified by the addition of another color resulting in a hue of lower key or value. So a tint is a lighter color. So red would be the hue and then pink here would be a tint of red. Um, and then a shade is a color or hue modified by the addition of another color resulting in a hue of lower key, so darker. Um, so if we look at these blue and green colors here, we could see that they're much darker blue here. So that those would be shades of blue. So this is Thomas Cole, his view from, I don't actually know how to pronounce that word. So Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, after a thunderstorm, the oxbow. Um, and in this one, he's using light, kind of like what we saw with Tintoretto. Um, where light equals good things and dark equals bad. And he's additionally kind of going with that um, and talking about civilization, which is over here. You can see all the farms and everything's pretty organized uh, versus the wild. And he puts the dark over the wild where everything is overgrown in its natural state. Um, so he's using uh, shades and tints uh, to kind of create uh, this idea of an organized area uh, versus an unorganized area, uh, civilization and his, his idea, uh, and then the wild over here. So JMW Turner, uh, he can do some pretty extreme effects with these techniques. Uh, this is light and color, and it's Goethe's theory. Uh, morning after the deluge, Moses writing the book of Genesis. Uh, so traditionally, Christians believe that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Modern biblical scholarship doesn't say that, but that's okay. 
Uh, and JMW Turner is imagining him picturing the actual flood. Uh, that's what this is, Noah's flood. Um, and in it, you can kind of see, oh, is it people in there? Is it animals? Uh, and we see this big circle that kind of like wipes them, wipes them away, just like the deluge would. So the reason why he's saying girth, girtha, is because the colors exist halfway between dark and light. Um, and that was an idea that Goethe had that you have white and you have black and then colors are exist between. Um, scientists don't really look at things in that way now, but it is useful if you're an artist to kind of think of things in that way. Uh, and you can even mix colors together if you want to use, you can use crayons and get those sort of effects. Uh, so even though Goethe's theory isn't really scientific as far as the way that light is created, uh, it is very helpful for artists. Uh, so in this one, um, he's using all these blacks and whites, and then the in-betweens are the colors. In this one, uh, Nikolai um, Boglai is doing a racing sideways. Uh, so kind of having using value where you have a white figure and then you have a black figure uh, and then the, the outfits going from white to black and perhaps thinking about um, the picture and what it could say about race. Uh, so maybe perhaps specifically about stereotypes about race and athleticism. So in this one, Ben Jones and his black face and arm unit and Ben Jones is black, if it's not entirely clear from this. Uh, and he was inspired by a poem by Ted Wilson uh, about um, having an experience of seeing some African drummers. Uh, and he made these pieces with um, open color schemes. So that means color schemes that are just using all of the colors. Uh, but as you can see, we have lots of darkness in the faces, uh, but also lots of bright and saturated colors. And I'll talk about what all those words mean. Uh, in just a moment. Uh, so kind of representing um, joy, but also like kind of a density of decoration, uh, like Ted Wilson would be hearing in the drums, uh, but making it in the art himself. Um, so this one is an Oni head from the Ife people. Uh, and the Ife people are an ancient people, but in modern times, uh, the Yoruba uh, in West Africa who live mostly in Nigeria, but in some other countries as well, uh, see the um, Ife as being their ancestors. Um, so we can kind of see that this is what Ben Jones was probably working with uh, when he made his uh, faces in the previous slide. So for the Ife, this is a very idealized and beautiful face. So you can see the perfect symmetry, uh, an incredible shape of the eyes and the nose and the mouth. Uh, and Ben Jones is using um, these heads from ancient Ife as inspiration. So Akun Akban Abuje, who's Nigerian, uh, he's also using colors. So one thing to think about with colors is that they'll often have symbols, symbolism to them, but the symbols will be different in different cultures. So there is no universal um, kind of idea about what color means. So this particular piece was made for a Nuomo shrine, um, which is, uh, is what they make whenever there's the death of an EBA Owo society member. Uh, so in West Africa, a lot of cultures, they have societies that um, kind of like organize different ways of life. So you often have women's societies and men's societies, uh, and then you'll have some co-ed societies and they'll function in a way there'll be like um, courts and things like that, but they'll also be like, um, there'll also be organizations that like a woman's society will make sure that uh, women are getting a voice and they're balancing um, men's societies. Uh, it's a way to basically get people to participate. So democracy as the Americans would say uh, and how society is organized. So in this particular culture, um, the colors, uh, the way that they're used and the symbolism isn't necessarily the same as they would be in say, uh, so-called Western culture, so European culture. 
So in this one, white equals death. Uh, and a lot of West African societies kind of look at that, like they'll have uh, white painted figures that will represent death or uh, figures from the spiritual world. And then black equals life. And you can see it with these blackened fish that people are cooking over a pot. So it makes sense that it's life because that's good stuff and you need to eat for life. And then red equals the blood of the warrior. And then we see combinations of these colors throughout. Um, so remember, when you think of colors, there is no universal color meaning. It depends on the culture. Uh, and different cultures will use different color meanings. And even within a culture, uh, depending on who's using it, there'll be different color meanings. So basic color vocabulary. Uh, the picture on the top showing color separated by a prism uh, is the way that color works with light. Um, and this is very scientific. <laughs> Uh, so if you take white light and the sun is an example of white light uh, and put it through a prism, it'll break up light into its components. Uh, and you can see that it's made out of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. Uh, and scientists know that violet is the highest frequency of light. Uh, light is just electromagnetic energy. Uh, and the frequency that we can see, uh, the highest frequency we can see is violet and the lowest frequency we can see is red. So light that we can't see that's on the higher frequency just above it is called ultraviolet. Uh, and just below it um, that we can't see is called infrared. Um, so the way that color is used has extreme complexity throughout the world because again, it's based on culture. Even the way that people would define colors is based on culture. Um, so the spectrum is scientific, but as far as how actually colors are actually used, it'll be different in different cultures. Uh, so the primary colors, and again, this is kind of like a, isn't the way that every culture thinks of it, uh, but probably most do, uh, is red, yellow, and blue. And you can kind of see with this color reveal right here, how that's set up. We have, we have yellow right here, blue right here, and actually I should change the color because that's not the best looking blue. Uh, and then red over here, and you can see how they're evenly spaced throughout uh, this color. And then the rest of the colors are in between those. So primary colors are red, yellow, and blue. The secondary colors are orange, green, and violet. So you can see them exactly between um, each of the primary colors. And then the intermediate colors are primary and the neighboring secondary. So an intermediate color between yellow and orange is yellow-orange, although you might have fancier names for it. And then same thing with um, yellow and green. We have yellow, green. So primary colors, yellow, um, secondary color, green, and then the tertiary color or intermediate color is yellow, green. So there's a couple of different ways of mixing color and you get two different results depending. Uh, so subtractive is mixing two primaries, which results in a dark darker secondary, so lower key. So if you look at the picture on the left, you can see how we mix this yellow, and this should be um, <laughs> look kind of purple, but you mix them together and you get darker colors in the middle. And then um, in the very middle, you just get brown. So if you mix all the colors together and you can try this with crayons, uh, you'll get brown kind of in the middle. Um, so then additive is mixing two primaries, which results in a brighter secondary. Uh, so we can see that with this. So whenever um, you're using color on a page with pigment, you're gonna get this subtractive effect. If you're using color with light, like say using colored lights, uh, like they do uh, on a stage or um, at a rock show or something like that, uh, then you'll get a different effect. So. Uh, when you're using a light, you're basically doing the opposite of what a pr prism does when you mix them together. So you can see when you mix all of the colors together, uh, it goes back to white. So all the colors are rainbow and that makes it into white. So the intensity or saturation, I'm actually like did a little Photoshop trick to make it look this way, um, means uh, the relative purity of a color's hue and the function of its relative brightness or dullness. So when you think of a saturated color, think of, wow, it's exactly that color. It's more of that color. It's almost glowing in that color. Uh, and then when you have low saturation or dull color, 
um, it looks like this. So you can see here, all the colors are kind of muted. There's not really much there. Uh, so if you look at his cloak on God, it doesn't really seem to have a color. Here, it's pink. Uh, when you look at his hair, it just looks like black and white. Here, it's just like the silver that's glowing. Uh, we see the blues up here on the hill, and then they're just like the colors all washed out in this. Uh, so intensity or saturation refers to how intense the colors seem. So color schemes, uh, and again, these are very cultural, uh, and especially when it comes to meaning. Uh, but there's some basic ways that we can talk about it, uh, and then we can show the ways it's used uh, in various cultures. Uh, so one way of looking at it is an analogous color schemes. That's colors that neighbor each other on the, on the color wheel. Uh, so we can see that in this particular picture from Sanford Gifford. We're just having things um, between yellow and orange, basically. And we see lots of yellow and orange colors. And then the color temperature, temperature is the relative warmth or coolness of a given hue. So generally, when you see colors on the red, yellow, orange spectrum, people perceive those to be warm. Fire is warm. Uh, if you see the sun, like it is with this, it's either, um, this is most likely this, the sunset. It has kind of a warm feeling when everything looks red and orange. And then colors like blue and green are thought to be cool colors. Uh, so a warm analogous color scheme is what we're seeing in this one from Gifford. And then a cool analogous color scheme, even though there is some warm colors in here, is what we're seeing from Whistler right here uh, and his nocturne in black and gold, the falling rocket. So when you have lots of colors that are on the blue green uh, side, then we usually call that an analogous cool color scheme. Sometimes you can use warm and cool together to create these very cool contrasts, uh, especially if you want to have some drama, or something that shows a little bit of conflict in the picture. So this is Romare Bearden, um, who is an African-American artist in his fall of Troy. Uh, and he likes to do things in a kind of modernist way. So things are very, very stylized, meaning they don't look quite like real life. Um, and you can see with this one, if you're familiar with the, the story of Troy, uh, the Greeks, they attack the Trojans and burn down their castle. Uh, after using this horse, which is pictured right here, um, to sneak in some of the Greek soldiers. So he's got lots of blue, the blue cool water um, right here. Uh, and that's how the Greeks make their way over here. Uh, and it's kind of peaceful. And you see the same thing with the um, castle. But then when you put the red and yellow on there, uh, it has this kind of anger effect. Put the two together. Um, and you have a conflict. Um, so in the story of Troy, even though it's wrote, wrote by the, written by the Greeks, the Greeks seem very violent <laughs> and angry, uh, whereas the Trojans are seen as more peaceful. Uh, so you can use a cool color scheme to represent you know, peace or calm uh, and sometimes warm, or even in this case, when it's lots of red, we would say it's a hot color scheme uh, to represent things that are more intense or even violence in this case. So sometimes you can use color effects uh, in interesting ways. Uh, so this is one where you can kind of stare at it for a while while I'm talking. Uh, and it helps if you just keep your eye very, very still, like stare at the middle of the picture, for instance, um, and then do that for about 30 seconds. And then when you close your eyes, uh, you'll be able to see an after image. Um, and what it'll look like is the two figures are the opposite color and the background um, is the opposite color. So the background will look green when you close your eyes and the two figures will look red. Um, so when you have these very, very intense complementary color schemes, meaning opposites on the color wheel, uh, like this with no borders in between them, you can have those sorts of effects. Um, so the after image is the tendency of an eye to see the complementary color of an image after it's removed. Um, so again, try that, you know, really stare into the middle of this picture um, and then look away and close your eyes and you'll, you'll see something uh, that seems kind of brighter. Uh, so Golub has taken advantage of this effect in Mercenaries 3, this intense clash between the red and the green to show what these men do. Uh, they're hired. 
uh, killers by various countries around the world, including, including the United States. Um, so these are violent men and they, they do violence for money. Uh, so the intensity of the red versus the green um, kind, of a, kind of makes an intense effect uh, that represents what these men do. So in this one, Georges Seurat, he's dealing with a, a kind of hypothesis about color that you may or may not think works, but it sort of does, sort of doesn't. Uh, and this style came to be called pointillism, uh, small points of complementary color, and they kind of mix in the eye. Uh, that was the idea. He actually called it divisionism. So his idea was, is that just like when we mix color in the page, if you put, and you can do this with crayons, uh, if you put red, if you put yellow and blue together, what do you get? It makes green. Um, when you do the crayons together, he's basically going with that effect. So instead of painting green, he paints tiny dots right next to each other um, with um, the colors, the primaries or secondaries that are on the sides of the color that he wants to make. So you, may or may not think that it actually worked this way. He thought it would make a color look more realistic. Perhaps it does, perhaps it doesn't, but it's a very cool effect. So this is the Munsell color wheel because when people first looked at it, made the color wheel, um, they realized over time that it doesn't quite work uh, exactly how it should. Uh, so the traditional color wheel doesn't really express true complementary color relations. Um, and we already kind of saw that with mercenaries before. Um, and you can see that by kind of looking at the after image and you see, yeah, the opposites aren't quite what they are in a color wheel. So the Munzer color wheel is to fix that. Uh, instead of having three primaries, you have five of them, yellow, green, blue, violet, and red. And then if you were to make um, images with complementary colors, uh, then you would get an after image that is closer to this color wheel than it is to the original color wheel that we looked at. And a lot of cultures understood that a long time ago uh, because sometimes they would see it in nature and then they would use it uh, in their pictures. Uh, so in the case of this feather mask um, from the, I actually don't know how to pronounce uh, this culture's name, but they live in Brazil. Uh, and they use the feathers of a really cool bird <laughs> that has this blue, violet, uh, orange, and yellow kind of color scheme. Uh, and they happen to be opposites on the Munsell color wheel. Uh, so perhaps this bird evolved these opposites uh, to make it a little bit more difficult to pinpoint their position or for some kind of camouflage. Uh, but as you can see, when you put it in this colored mask, it just makes everything very intense as it seems to glow. So Charles Searles, uh, who's another African-American artist, um, he, uh, like many African-Americans in the 60s, started taking trips to Africa, uh, talking to people there, learning about African cultures. Uh, and he took a trip to Nigeria. Uh, and he went to a series of outdoor shops. Um, and people were just, he was just like amazed when he was there. <laughs> He's like, look at all these things that people are selling. Like everyone seems to be talking at once. Everyone's clothes are just so colorful. Uh, it's just like this incredibly energetic, almost like musical environment. The sun is super bright. Um, that's because it's closer to the equator. Uh, and everything is just seems more intense uh, and um, kind of more energetic than anything. So he uses what's called an open palette to get this effect. So uh, a restricted versus an open palette. A closed or a restricted palette is one employing only a few colors, and an open palette is one use, utilizing a full range of hues. So a lot of times artists, if they want to have an effect that's a little bit more still, they'll use closed palettes, um, you know, maybe with complementary colors, but maybe not. And then um, if artists want to have like a lot more energy in, in the sense that there's so much going on, you can't possibly bring it in, you can use an open palette like um, Searles has done here. Uh, so it's called Filas for Sale. Uh, and Filas are these hats right here. Um, and the people that are pictured here are, are the Hausa people. Uh, and I remember um, the first time I taught this class, 
there was a student in class and she was Hausa uh, and she was talking about going to when she was a small child going to um, open markets like this. So sometimes artists can do some very interesting things uh, with color where if you see it very closely, it doesn't seem to be anything, uh, but you see it from far away, it becomes something. Uh, so this is Chuck Close and his picture of Stanley. Uh, so when you see the picture from far away and it is huge, it looks like the one on the right, but when you get in close, this is what you see. You just see circles of color. Uh, and by placing these in just the right way uh, to create highlights and hues and shades, uh, when you get far away, then this person shows up in a hyper-realistic way. So it's very expressive when you get close to it, uh, but then it's hyper-realistic when you get far away. Uh, so I'll include a link that's pictured here to uh, the picture of George Bush. Um, but what it is, is using this same technique, but instead of having in a boxes uh, circles, it has all of the soldiers, it was made in 2004, uh, pictures of all the soldiers who had died in uh, the Iraq war. And then when you zoom out, you see George W. Bush. Um, so pretty obvious meaning there showing who is responsible for the deaths of all these people, uh, George Bush. So I'll include this link uh, in the description of this video. So color and representational art. There's a couple of different ways of using color. The simplest way is um, local color. And this is what you do when you're a kid, when you have your crayon box. You say, oh, I'm going to paint a fire hydrant. Fire hydrants are red. You get your red crayon. I want to paint um, some bricks. And then you get the red. <laughs> you get the red crayon again. It's like the tree has green leaves. So you get the green crayon. Uh, and it's just like the basic color as if it existed away from the atmosphere and the light. Uh, it's, it's not like a color you would ever see in real life. So local color is the actual color of an object independent of light or atmosphere. So if you were in a studio and you had these things and this perfect studio light, then yeah, it might look red or it might look green. Um, but local color isn't what you actually see uh, in most places. What you see instead is perceptual colors. Uh, and Claude Monet, uh, when he was looking at the art of his time in the 19th century, he said, people are never portraying the way light actually looks and the way color actually looks. Uh, so if you think about it, like when you see things uh, and if you, um, like when the sun's going down or when the sun's coming up is the best way to see it, uh, or you're inside of your house uh, and you have lamps on, uh, and they're very dim lamps versus like the middle of the day when the sun's coming in. You can see that things seem to be different colors. Uh, so if it's the sunrise, you might see lots of blues and purples. Uh, if it's a sunset, you might see lots of orange and warm colors. And that light will lay upon objects and they'll look like they're a different color. Uh, so we call those perceptual colors. Uh, and the way that Monet got this effect is he actually went outside and instead of doing drawings and then painting inside, he brought his canvas outside and tried to portray the colors that he saw as he saw them. It meant that he had to make the paintings pretty quickly. So you can see here, he's doing lots of strokes very quickly, but it does get the effect of perceptual colors that wasn't really being portrayed in art until he started doing it. Um, and then, Another way of using color is arbitrary color. And what arbitrary color means is basically you look at things and you say, I can pick whatever color I want. So is this woman an orange person? Uh, no, she's not. <laughs> you know, is this person purple? I don't think so. Uh, does all these background plants, are they like purple and light blue? No, but... Uh, with arbitrary color, you can pick it whatever you want, and you can get a cool color scheme, almost like a design if you're painting your walls. So the symbolic use of color, uh, many different painters use uh, different effects uh, in um, 
in symbolic color. Uh, so again, these are cultural ideas. So a lot of times, if you look at this painting from Vincent van Gogh, the night cafe, you're like red and green, that's Christmas. Uh, but that's not what uh, red and green meant in 19th century France. Instead, he tried to pick the ugliest greens he could and the ugliest reds that he could, which are opposites. Uh, and by putting these together to make something kind of ugly, uh, and he talks about in this quote, I don't have to read the whole thing, I can summarize it for you, uh, that in this picture, um, it shows the ugliest combination of red and green. And it shows that the cafe, which is a bar, um, this is a place where people can go to um, kind of lose their minds. And Van Gogh, uh, his favorite color was yellow. Uh, so oftentimes, if he puts himself in a picture, uh, you can pick it out. So he's right here wearing the yellow hat. And you can see how everyone stooped down. This is a bartender. <laughs> this is the funny thing. Pharmacists are dressed like bartenders uh, in Europe dressed in the 19th century. Perhaps they're doing the same job. Uh, and you can see how people had their heads down uh, and the combination of red and green creates this intensity. Even his face is orange and his hair is green in this one. Uh, so Van Gogh himself had troubles with alcohol. Uh, so he's kind of portraying some of these, the troubles he's having by using red and green together. So in this one, Kandinsky and his black lines. And Kandinsky did a bunch of pictures like this. Uh, he believed that um, you could create pictures that people from any culture could relate to if you just use colors and lines. Uh, and there's something to that because uh, depending on how you make a picture, uh, even if it's a pretty realistic one, people from other cultures might perceive that as meaning something. But when you just have colors and lines, uh, they may perceive different meanings to the colors, um, but there is something that they could get out of it. Um, so he talks about how all of these colors have very specific meanings to him, uh, and he's hoping that um, people can get the meaning directly, regardless of what culture they're from.